If the world needs lots of trees, then a tree nursery business is probably a good business to be in. And um, that, uh, have, having a good strategy like that, probably made up for not being very good at a whole lot of the aspects of tree growing. Um, but once I started, then I got stuck into all the books I could find and found people I could learn from and over a few years got better at propagating trees. And, uh, and then uh, started to realise that the art to running a nursery wasn't just propagating trees, it was actually finding people who wanted the trees you propagated. Because it was pretty easy to propagate a lot of trees and then go, what do we do with all these trees? Um, so the, the nursery grew and was quite successful and by 1986, and, and we used to, we focused a lot on farm trees, on reforestation, on plantation forestry, agroforestry, and on permaculture, food production trees. And people would come into the nursery and I'd get books out, drawings, whatever, and say, this is what you can do. And we started to think it'd be a good idea if we could actually show people what you could do with trees on a farm rather than try to explain it. So the idea of this farm was to set it up as a demonstration. And we moved here in 1986 with truckloads of baby trees and we're going to expand the nursery and the first area, we grew a lot of deciduous trees in the ground and the first area, so planted in 1986, was a, a tree nursery here. And there's actually, an, uh, not a, yeah, there's an aerial photo up on the board if you have a look at it from when the nursery was really functioning and this was a block of baby trees, you know, so big or so big. The other thing we did uh, to get trees growing quickly is we planted a whole lot of tree lucerne. So if you see that, there's an old one there. We, we, I think we planted 5,000 or 10,000 in belts all through the farm and they, they grow very rapidly. They're a, a legume and they gave us very quick shelter and they sheltered all the other trees and they also provided food for cows and for birds and for bees and, and all the rest of it. They're a very generous plant. They just, and they're, they're a nitrogen fixer so they improve the soil. So we did all that, we set up the farm we ran the nursery here from 86 to 94, I think. And then we sold the, the nursery business and we were left with a farm covered in trees. And, and our strategy was that uh, on the fruit and nut trees that each year, if we couldn't sell them, we'd plant them out. So it was a pretty random thing. So over there, there's beautiful blood plums. Well, we, we, most years we'd sell most of the blood plums. So we planted about a dozen blood plum trees but we also got very interested in both new and old apple varieties. And there were some fantastic new varieties just come into the country from Japan. And we thought, well, nobody's going to want all these old varieties like Jonathan's and Granny Smith's and Red Delicious when there's going to be these beautiful new varieties. And none of the other orchardists wanted these new varieties, so we planted them. And so the little red apple over there is an Akane, a Japanese apple. It's a magnificent apple, but the industry still doesn't really use very much of it. Okay, I think that's probably by, by way of introduction. I'll just do a little, you just for those of you who've got a good kind of visual mapping brain, I'm going to show you, because a lot of people get really confused once we start walking around in amongst the trees. You came in the gate, uh, the main house is there. You walk down here, the, the little marquee is over there near where it says X Nursery. We're here. We're going to go down into this. This was the first orchard planted. And I'm going to show you where you can pick your own Akane later in the day or whenever it suits you. We're going to walk around up along this windbreak, depending on how we're going for time, down here towards the dam, back up through another orchard and back into this paddock here. So when we're not on tour, we just request that you stay in this main block, in the block the picnic's in. Okay, any questions? No, no let's go. Um, those of you who aren't from around here, you have to try to imagine the biggest forest you've ever been into. These hills were covered in the most enormous trees, probably average diameter of about one and a half to two metres. And the accounts of the early settlers is that they couldn't see the sky, it was such dense forest. And if you get a chance, if you go up on the back of Mount Worth, you can have a walk through forest like that or up on the slopes of the Borbore Range. And the, these farms were all settled in 
uh, after the Victorian gold rush in the 1880s, maybe late 1870s, uh, under uh, closer settlement schemes. So the Victorian government uh, basically gave out, or at notional prices, 100 acre farms. And there were five brothers of the same family settled five of those farms here, and their main uh, enterprise was sawmilling. And they, they sawmilled off those slopes, and they had their own railway line into the, um, into the government line at Darnham. And I would, wouldn't recommend contour planting for orchards because uh, uh, you have to be a really good tractor driver with your mowers so you don't, if you knock, the, see there's holes in all these rows, that's because every time you're turning your, your rear implement's moving out a bit and you knock the trees around. So there's a good reason why orchardists like things in nice straight rows. Everywhere. Ah, that's a good question. We'll come to that. Almonds. The first year we got uh, uh, a basket of almonds, first year they cropped about that big, and ever since the birds have got them. They, they don't even let them get, the shells get hard, they just rip them, rip into them. These are remnant rows of a nursery. Yeah. I, had, I had actually seen it, this abandoned nurseries, and I was involved in um, salvage sawmilling in old, you know, hedges that had come up. And it, you know, if you, it's, it's a cruel way to do it because it's so competitive, but the strongest survive. And uh, we, do, we are going through occasionally and thinning out rows when we've got spare time or the energy. You do. You don't get any side branches. Yep, that's the idea. We'll get to a few spots that are good to for a crowd to gather. Okay, so these are the Akanes for pick your own. There's about half a row. They've been left on the trees about two weeks longer than we would for commercial harvest. And they're a beautiful, they actually get sweeter. They're just delightful apple to eat when they've been allowed to ripen like that. But those of you with your, you can pick them now or you can come back later and pick them. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, you can eat them, eat them straight off the tree if you want. Um, while, while some are picking, I'll explain to others what we've done here. We've planted uh, the rows, are, well the rows are about four metres apart on the contour. And we've got some nut trees, some apple rows and some stone fruit rows all mixed together. This is probably the most chaotic or diverse of our orchards. And we've gone to more sort of commercial approaches in the other two orchards. Akane. Akane. Akane, yep. Yeah, of course. A K A N E. Do I worry about the height? No, no. It doesn't worry me. They're actually on a dwarf rootstock. So they're 30 year old trees and they occasionally will top them back. But yeah, that good height. You get most of it from a ladder. Yeah. Okay. Did you just go at random or was there a plan about what species were? It evolved is probably better than 
either of the two. Um, we, we planted the nut trees first and I had about a dozen apple trees and I put them in in the very first year we got here and I was so impressed at how well they grew and from then on we got keen on growing more apple trees. And this, this block is, uh, I won't say it's random, but, but the, with the later blocks we planted them with early varieties here in ripening sequence and got a bit more structured about what it was going to be like to run an orchard. Um, but yeah, the, so, and spacing is all quite deliberate and so on. Okay, we'll walk along this row and we'll come out the other end of this orchard. Uh, Mutsu, that's another Japanese variety. They're, pr they're probably ready. You kids can pick up some of those green apples if you want off the ground. That'll be nice. They're called Mutsu. And they're like a Japanese Granny Smith, beautiful eating, beautiful cooking. Best cooking apple we grow, I think. There's a screaming badger. Oh, that's a trade secret. I see. We make it for more than 10 varieties. Okay, let's walk this way. What can you kids hear? What are they? Are they birds? No. Nah. We'll go to that where the noise is coming from in a minute. What about this one Hello. Here? Oh. Here, yeah, who wants some apples? Oh, they're a beautiful looking apple. And it's a beautiful eating apple. And the name in Japanese. Can anybody guess what it means? Red. Red, yeah. Did you know that? Yeah, aren't they amazing colour? And they haven't taken off. There you go. Oh, it should be a good fruit picker. There's plenty more. Okay, let's keep moving if you want to see more of the farm. What do you think? It's awesome. Yeah, it's good, isn't it? Pretty nice having all this food. Pigs? Nah, we don't. We've tried that once or twice. Okay, who was asking about the cockies? See that cockatoo damage there? Yeah. That tree would have had like, ooh, say 150 kilos of apples on it. Now it's got about five kilos of apples on it. And the cockies have come through and they're mostly interested in the seeds. So they're just stripping the tree, pulling the seeds out and, um, and they drop the fruit on the ground. Yep, big cockies, white cockies. And um, yeah, nobody, you know, you won't find this in the books, but if you grow a lot of food, especially if you grow food all year round, you provide a perfect habitat for all the things that want to eat food all year round. But then if you come along here, I'll show you what we do. We still pretty much work on everything in nature is food for something else. So we often have a couple of wedge tail eagles and a few other things. And you see the, cock uh, the cockies or the rosellas all go screaming off. Oh, how do you reckon we got up there? Tom and I did that. We would have had a tall ladder, huh? Okay. That's an electronic bird scarer. 
making a whole lot of noises that scare birds, disrupt their communication. We have two of them working. One just uses sounds that the birds are like their, their emergency calls, like the crow's emergency call. But it wasn't working against the cocky, so we bought this new chip, and this is meant to be like this is meant to what hell sounds like if you're a cockatoo. Oh. <laughs> Haven't seen any cockies here lately, so it's probably working. All right, let's get in the shade, huh? On the internet. <laughs> now, Bird Guard, it's called. They advertise quite extensively. We don't know if it works or if the birds have just decided to go somewhere else. It does happen, doesn't it? Try that one for me. I think that's probably right. Looking by the colouring and the... Gold ones. Yep, golden apples, golden delicious apples. Oh. We, we, I'll, I'll go back at, there's no formula as to when to pick the fruit. You have to just keep on testing it and seeing if it's ripe. And we have lots of ways of testing it, but the most simple way is whether it comes off easily off the tree. That normally is a good indication that it's ready. But we do everything from um, uh, kind of scientifically based tests to see where the starches and sugars are up to to just going out and tasting them. Like, uh, like oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> but if you want some golden delicious in your bags, this, you could probably pick them along here. Ah, oh, it's a pecan tree. We use a iodine staining method, which you cut the apple in half, dip it in iodine solution, and you can read it as to how advanced the sugar, the conversion from starch to sugar is. Jason, do you have a possum problem? No. Mm. It's only on in daylight hours, okay. and then it's, um, uh, I think it's random, but it's roughly about every 20, or 20 minutes or something, that noise. Yep. And is it on a battery? That's uh, it's just like a car battery. Yeah. That'll last most of the season. Right. Okay. okay um, We'll wait for the rest to gather. Is it still yours? Yep. Yep. So our farm goes from the road back. Um, oh well, on this side, on this side, about eight or nine hundred metres, and on that side, nearly a kilometre. And it's about four hundred metres wide. And that four hundred metres by a kilometre is forty hectares or uh, hundred acres. Okay, we got most, oh no, we got a few scragglers. So, um, you'd think this was stage managed, but so these paddocks, which are grass paddocks, are managed by our neighbours who are just walking up here as if they're like enter stage left, who, who are organic dairy farmers and free range chook farmers. So, Peter and Wendy Wallace manage the animal side of the land and uh, we've decided we're tree people and they're animal people. So you'd think that was stage managed, your entry would just, yeah. 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 Waiting to see the crowd emerge, huh? Yeah. Uh, maybe, do you want to say anything about how you manage your pastures or our pastures? Is, 
Yep. Yeah. And have it, they have a few caravans with free range chooks as well, which we'll probably see later on. And uh, yeah, I think relative to a lot of dairy farmers, Peter and Wendy tend to do long rotations. So the paddocks often get big long spells and then the stock come in and uh, get a fair bit of feed. And we've noticed since they've been managing it that way, the pastures lo are looking a lot better, a lot healthier because they're not being flogged all the time by cows eating the stuff as soon as it grows. And they're very friendly chooks. We find when we're picking in the orchard, they come up and have a chat. It's true. They, you're like, they come right round your feet. And you're... Okay, so back to the trees. We, these, uh, you can see the windbreaks planted. These are 30 year old windbreaks. When I planted, when we planted them, we put a lot of wattles in. And a lot of people said, you're mad planting wattles. They only last 10 or 15 years. Well, they most of them have lasted a bit longer, but there's a lot of them fallen down. And we're quite deliberate about leaving the fallen timber as habitat. Um, we've got lots of little little things living here. Half of them, we don't even know what they are. But we're sure that, there's, you know, that we get a lot of spiders and uh, wasps and other things from this that help out in the orchards. And so we've got three orchard blocks, each with a surrounding of, uh, of mixed mostly native windbreaks. But the other thing we did when we planted them is we didn't just put all fast growing things in, in amongst them are slow growing trees like silky oaks. And as the big older tree, uh, the uh, wattles are falling out, these ones are pushing up. And uh, in the next windbreak, you can actually see quite good silky oaks and they'll, they'll live, oh well, they'll, they'll live for a hundred years past now. So there'll be a beautiful avenue of silky oaks or spotted gums or other things. And they're really tough. They've just been there. They just sit there waiting for their turn. And when the acacias come down, up they go. They're all, uh, somebody asked, did I plant them for timber? Um, yeah, as far as I'm concerned, just about every tree is planted for timber. Some of them will make great timber and some of them won't. And we'll have a look at some of the timber plantings a bit later on. And in the meantime, we get a lot of firewood and... Okay, let's keep walking. What a beautiful timber tree. Yeah, where's the chestnut? Ah, uh, chestnut, yep. Where's that? They're in there. They're hiding in amongst the orchards. Well, we walked through them. We walked past a couple. Oh. Um, there was a really big, big chin. Mmm. Yeah. Those golden delicious are really good. Yeah. We wouldn't normally pick them until mid March, but yeah. everything's early. Okay. Mmm. I think both. For about another three or four years, I suppose. For what? For the end of the year. Oh. They can go back up into the. If you're out. I shouldn't say that. No, then they'll be free range kids. Yeah, exactly. That's why I said I shouldn't. Down that hill, you'll see some chooks. Yep, that's a chook caravan. You ever seen a chook caravan?
Uh, I think we can leave this one open. I, I think I'm going to be doing a few more of these. Oh, we're doing alright. Only been going 18 minutes. Do you guys want to go up to where all the picnickers are? And that up there, are they? Yeah, yep. Yep. it's all right. set up just I was just out from the house, in amongst the oak trees. No drama, we'll wander up. Oh. Right, um, just Bella down there, the next Yeah. She'll be right. She'll be all right? Yeah, oh, well, yeah. Yep. What do you reckon the calls from the side back in that eagle? Ah, uh, actually dead. The whole thing's dead, that one. Yeah, ah, uh, probably drought. It's been very dry. Yeah. It's like driest in living memory. <laughs> No rain, it's great. Green. Greened up a bit now. We had a bit of rain in late January, but and we've had a bit of cooler weather. Mm. But but yeah, no no spring it's rain. Soaking, though, has it? Nah, not here. Okay, um, it's probably a reasonably good spot just to get a view of the. There's another or, big orchard right down the bottom there. You can just see the edge of, and there's another one in here behind the chest. There's a row of chestnut trees there. And you can see the big line of uh, eucalypts that's on our western boundary. So that was the, we, we cop a lot of cold, strong winds from the southwest. And uh, somebody asked before, was it sort of, did you have a plan? Well, our plan was pretty simple. Uh, to stop the wind from the, from the west, we also get quite strong winds from the, from the east. And because we're on a southern slope, we didn't want to shade everything by planting tall trees across on the east-west line. So most of the east-west lines are things like those chestnuts, which will get fairly big, but nowhere near as big as the eucalypts. We'll let the sun into the paddocks. Um, somebody else asked, were we interested in growing timber? And the answer is yes. This, all through the belts of eucalypts are intended to grow. They're planted very close and they're intended to be pushed up tall no side limbs and there's uh, at the time every kind of species that we thought might do well in terms of farm timber. What's happening though is we're pretty convinced that spotted gum is probably the best farm timber we can grow around here. It's a little bit slower than blue gum but not much but it's a much better timber. It's a much denser, stronger, beautiful timber and it's also much more suitable to saw when it's a small diameter log. It makes much better timber out of farm grown trees. And if I have any reason for wood, I'll just get a little mobile sawmill in and knock a few trees down and cut them up. But right now I don't need any more wood. And we have been getting uh, rid of cypress trees that are about a hundred years old and sawing them up over time. And in that paddock, that's the last group we pulled out was in the middle of this paddock, just lying on the ground there, waiting to saw them up. I don't think so. There's a lot of dieback of the cypress with cypress canker, I think it is, or it's a fungus uh, around Pakenham on the wetter ground. But here on the red soil, they seem to be doing all right. They just fall apart. They just get too big and they fall apart. Okay, let's go down the hill. And I'm, I'm sort of wary about the time, but we'll see how far we can go down and then back up. They used to be. Come up. Cows come. Sass. 
in a system called shelter wood. So we give the trees, the young trees, shelter. That also helps for uh, moisture and light. And uh, where the tagasas are dying off, the walnuts have done a lot better. Just check the sound. We're right. We're right. Okay. Uh, no, that's walnut. Oh, that's walnut. But we've got a lot of persimmons on the hill, yep. We've got a lot of everything. They're tough tree persimmons. Never been watered, never been sprayed. So you sell that fruit? Yep. We, that, um, we sell it at the farmers, both. Oh, yeah. We sell a lot of them at the farmers markets. Like oh, no, there's both there. There's about, there's about 10 different varieties in the wow. persimmon lock. Yeah. You can't leave it alone, but if you've got to pull the walnuts off. The guard dog. The auctions are surplus dollars worth of netting, and that's just the beginning of it. You then start to uh, you have all this equipment to put it out, and it gets ripped, gets stuck in things. And, and, uh, uh, at the moment, the 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 the, the birds aren't that big a problem. We keep thinking they'll become a problem, and. <laughs> Uh, you know, there's too many other problems to deal with apart from the ones that don't yet exist, so. Uh, we don't have a fruit fly problem, fortunately. Um, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll talk to everybody to that question. That's, um... We'll find a shady spot. We won't, we won't go into the orchard, we'll just stand and look at it. Um, there's a big guard dog here. She's uh, pretty, pretty friendly. Yeah. Sure, where it is, but when she realises there's a whole lot of people, she might come up. We're just going to stand in the shade just here. Oh, I'm going to sit down. Look at that. Oh. oh, there's a few ants on that. You might have ants in your pants. Hello, Bella. She's all right. Okay, this is uh, the biggest of the orchards we have. This is the, mo the most productive, uh, in, in, yeah, no, in terms of tons of fruit produced. It's also at the best place in the landscape for, a, for an orchard because it's at the toe of the hill. The soil's deeper 
and the roots go down there's a lot more moisture here than on the top of the hill um, we don't we stopped watering our orchard in 2006 or 7 and uh, even ripped out all the irrigation lines and then um, I've put irrigation back on this year for the first time so 10 years later we just had such a dry spring and summer we were in danger of not getting a crop but most years we've been getting crops of apples this big without just on rainfall and somebody asked what do we do for disease pest and disease which is um it's a it's a long I'll, I'll try to give a very short answer but for 30 years we really haven't had a problem with codling moth um, again we just reckon we had enough birds bats spiders earwigs and other things that eat codling moth and there was always a few there or what I say for 30 years for, let's say for 28 years and then the last couple of years we started to get a bit worried about it and years ago we took on the Lisa Petty's orchard which is a very old orchard and was full of codling moth and we wanted to make it organic and so we started we imported a virus a codling moth virus and we, we this year we've used that plus the chooks and we've got the population right back down again they're there and people say it must be terrible being an organic farmer you must lose so much fruit to grubs and I always say I lose more fruit to bad pickers who bruise them than I do to the grubs right and if only I could get good pickers then I you know that 10% of the crop wouldn't be damaged so the grubs really aren't a big problem our biggest problem is uh, apple scab which is a, a forms a black mark on the fruit and we spray copper in the winter or copper Bordeaux mix in the winter and sulfur in the spring and if we get a very dry season like this we get a very clean crop and some years we get a bit of an ugly crop and the scabby ones normally go to juice or cider making okay and then behind me apart from the chooks is uh we've got a big dam that we put in when we first came here for watering the the uh, nursery and we've grown potatoes commercially in these paddocks for a few years we grew potatoes before we planted these trees I don't know where I read it but I read that it was traditional in many parts of the world if you're gonna if you're gonna go to the effort of plowing up the ground for an orchard you might as well get a crop out of it but all that working in and whatever means that your young trees have got a much better chance so it seemed to work this the trees grew a lot better here than they did up the top, which wasn't cultivated. Okay, and we'll go and have a look at the dam, and then we'll walk back up. Any questions? Oh, the question is how old is the orchard? Nearly all the orchards were planted uh, between 87 and about 91 or 92. Uh, uh, more different varieties in there and there's plums as well and this was planted over two years with the uh, the earliest at the bottom and the latest at the top but in two different blocks so when we're picking we can go we're in the early section and then we're watching the next variety oh that's getting ripe and then we're going up working our way up the hill have I've lost count we, 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 we've been going down, we've been pulling more out than we've been planting for about the last 20 years. So our view is they're better off having a fewer number that are well looked after than a whole lot. And we've also been regrafting trees, so we, we chop them down, put a different variety in. But uh, I would guess we've got somewhere, probably 3,000. We're about to walk through there. We do we prune, yes. No, don't, well, there's a few rabbits, but never a big problem here. Yeah. Oh, how many people help us? Um, look, to pick this orchard, it's probably a full-time job for about three or four people for about six weeks or eight weeks. But it's never that straightforward. And then the packing and selling the fruit. I mean, it might be three people. It depends on the crop. And pruning, it just depends. Sometimes it's one or two people working all winter. Sometimes it's a gang of people. Sometimes it's getting with chainsaws and lop trees back hard. Other times it's just doing fine work. So, yep. I have no idea. It's the nature of it. They're so productive, 
there's always stuff hits, hitting the ground. Either they're nearly ready and you get a windstorm, or we just leave it there. Feeds the worms. Okay, let's let's walk up up via the dam. <laughs> 